good God. <laughs> we serve a good God. <laughs> Not because he chooses to be, but because of who he is. We never have to worry about whether he's good or whether he's bad. He will forever and continue be good. To be our hope, to be our peace, to be our grace, and to be our mercy. To be the one that loves us, to be the one that cares for us, to be the one that we wish.
that are going through sickness, that are going through pain, myself included, ones that are dealing with allergies, dealing with recovery from operations. We pray, Father God, that your hand will be upon us, not because we simply just ask, because we know that you simply will do. We trust in you, because we know that you love us. We pray for the ones that are traveling. We also pray for our brothers and sisters on, in the Carolinas, in, in, in Georgia, in Virginia, the ones that are being hit and hammered by the hurricane. We thank you, God, that the ones that we've heard from are safe, and we give you glory, and we give you honor for their protection. But we also continue to pray that through this, Father, that your love will shine. As Drusa is there, and as your people continue to minister to the ones that are there, we thank you that through this, that your love will be seen, that your love will be received. And we thank you. If you're here today and you say, then I want to know what this love is. Why you're so passionate about this person. That I want to be able to know and to feel what that love is like. It's not hard. It's actually pretty simple. If you want to make that decision today, you can say, Jesus, I love you. That I believe in you, that my heart needs to be full of you. If you want to know what it feels like to be loved unconditionally, if you want to know what it feels like to be loved, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said or who you've harmed, Jesus is the one 
that you can do. So if today you want to know this love that we know, which is Jesus, and you want to make that commitment today, we don't want to embarrass you, but we just want to share the same love that he shared with us. Raise your hand and say that I want to know what that love is. We'll give you some material. Be with us in the end of church, in the back, and we just want to put some things in your hands and love on you. Father God, we thank you. Father God, we also pray for the ones that are on our movers' cards, the ones that we have made the commitment to, to say we want them to know who you are. We will continue to pray. We may not see the horrors, but God, I pray that we do. We will continue to pray for those 10 individuals on our cars that they will come to know your saving grace and your love and your peace. We thank you, Jesus. Before we transition, one more time, say, Jesus, I love you. Say, Jesus, I love you. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the word that's going to come forth today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that you will continue to be with us in and out of this world. And through all of us. In Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Before we get started, share some love with the ones around you. Get out from around you or get from around your comfort zone. And let someone know. this down except for zipping the sweater. I can't pull it off. He was a stud. He was a stud. Well, uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, for 35 uh, years, I believe it was, if I remember correctly, uh, he uh, actually 31 years, 865 episodes of changing your shoes, wearing uh, colored sweaters, which are hot, by the way, and uh, yeah, you know that it's coming off. So uh, every week he would do that. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but did you know that Mr. Rogers was an accomplished pianist? He, he actually had a music degree, and all the songs that he sung on the show almost exclusively, he wrote them all. So there's stuff we still don't know about him that we're learning. Uh, what we discovered was that uh, Mr. Rogers used his neighborhood to model kindness. 
And each week he was preaching to, to children, but he was also preaching to us. He was teaching us how to deal with uh, the difficult times in our lives like death and divorce and danger. He would use his neighborhood to show us how to be kind to one another, how to deal with uh, the, these different views and our fears and our prejudices in a non-threatening way. He did that over and over again. And so each week he was just preaching. One of the many sermons he preached uh, was this one. I want to read you, read to you what he said. This is a mini sermon. He said this. He said, out of differences can come the reinforcement of two important values. One is tolerance, and the other is awareness that people who disagree over things they hold dearly really can live together in love and in respect. He was preaching, amen? So we didn't shout him down while he was on TV, but we might as well have because that's all he's doing is preaching, right? So today, what I want to do um, uh, in this message and, and our time together today is I want to confront what I believe is perhaps one of the most difficult and challenging issues that we face in our lives today so that we will do our very best not to become neighbor haters, right? Because we're not supposed to be neighbor haters. So I want to give you some backdrop on what I'm getting ready to read to you. I'm going to read to you um, several passages out of the book of Acts and then one out of Galatians. But I just want to mention to you that in this uh, instance, just to give you some background, what's taking place is the day of Pentecost is taking place. Uh, the disciples are preaching publicly about Jesus and him resurrected from the dead and people are getting saved. And all of a sudden, when uh, Peter and John are preaching, the religious scholars get so upset about what they're preaching, they arrest them and they put them in jail and they said, you can't preach anymore. And so they, that's the backdrop. And so we, we fast forward to Acts chapter 4. And uh, the, the, they have put them on trial, and they're going to place them in front of the religious leaders and ask them to defend what they're doing. And, I, and I'm not going to read the whole defense. I'm just going to read the first phrase of what we, we discover. Because in Acts chapter 4, verse 8, this is what it says. As he's getting ready to, for his powerful speech, Peter, Peter's getting ready to give a powerful speech. This is what it says. It says, with that, Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, let loose. All right, so it says, he's full. okay, so let, let's fast forward now. We're going to keep going forward. In Acts chapter 10, after all that's taken place, I'm not reading the defense. You can read that on your own. We're going to fast forward now to Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, this is what happens. It says, about noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up to the roof to pray, and he became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance or had a vision and he saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. And it contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter said or replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time, do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to read what happens, but uh, some men show up at Peter's house. They knock on the door. They invite him to a Gentile's house by the name of Cornelius. And Peter, after this vision, goes with them, even though he's not supposed to be associating with Gentiles. And he shares the gospel. And then in Acts chapter 10, verse 45, you see what happens. Because the, uh, in, in Cornelius' household, men get saved. Gentile men get saved. And they get filled with the Spirit. And this is what Peter says in verse 45. He says, surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. Dealing with Gentiles. Okay, so now, one final fast forward. Now I want you to join me in Galatians chapter 2. In Galatians chapter 2, uh, something takes place. I want you to see what happens beginning in verse 11. It says, later when Peter came to Antioch, uh, I, being Paul, had a face-to-face -face confrontation with him because he was clearly out of line. Here's the situation. Earlier, before certain persons had, uh, had come from James, Peter regularly ate with non-Jews. But when the conservative group came from Jerusalem, he cautiously pulled back and put as much distance as he could manage between him and his non-Jewish friends. 
That's how fearful he was of the conservative Jewish clique that had been pushing the old system of circumcision. Unfortunately, the rest of the Jews in Antioch church joined in that hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was swept along in the charade. But when I saw that they were not maintaining a steady, straight course, according to the message, I spoke up. Somebody's got to speak up sometimes, right? He spoke up, and he said to Peter in front of them all, if you had... Uh, if you, a Jew, live like a non-Jew when you're not being observed by the watchdogs from Jerusalem, what right do you have to require non-Jews to conform to Jewish customs just to make a favorable impression on your old Jerusalem cronies? Mic drop, right? He just lays them out right there in front of everybody. So I want you to notice some things this morning as we confront, again, what I believe may be one of the most Uh, challenging issues in our culture today. I want to just teach you some things this morning. I want to show you out of Scripture three lessons that we need to learn from what we just read. The first one is this. It is possible to be spirit full and still only be skin deep. It is possible to be spirit full and remain skin deep. I want you to notice that if we're not careful, then we can allow skin to be more powerful and more important in our lives than we allow the Spirit to be important and powerful in our lives. Peter, the Bible says, I read it to you. These are not my words. This is Acts chapter 4. The Bible says that Peter was full of the Spirit. He was full of the Spirit. The problem was he was also full of hate. Oh, that's not even possible. I, I'm just reading Scripture. It says he was full of the Spirit, but he was, he was also full of hate. In fact, what I want to say to you this morning uh, is, it, very bluntly, just put it as blunt as I can, Peter was a racist. That's, that's a hot-button word in our society right now, isn't it? Racist. He was a racist. He was full of the Spirit. So we cannot deceive ourselves to believe that simply because we are full of the Spirit that we can't also at the same time be full of hate because Peter demonstrates for us that it's possible. In fact, what I'm going to say to you is that what we discover is that it took subsequent subsequent work by God to, to dig down, intentionally go after the hate that Peter had established in his heart. Because when you read Scripture, what you discover is that God now confronts Peter three different times and the same vision over and over and over again to, to, to dig through all this, this preconceived prejudice and ideas that he had about non-Jewish people, even though he was full of the Spirit. I, I, um, I, I believe that racism has to be intentionally rooted out. I think you got to go after it. I don't think enough people talk about it. I don't think I don't think that those of us that are supposed to love everybody really deal with it like we should because it's still there and it lingers and we don't root it out. And in this instance, God had to root it out of Peter's life. He had to confront it. Uh, I know that the day of Pentecost, we, when we as Pentecostals, we begin to talk about the day of Pentecost, we talk about the fact that Pentecost is supposed to be this unifying day, right? It was this, They were all unified in the spirit. The only dilemma was is that it was one specific group that was unified. And it took God working on, on his disciples and on his, on his men, his, his, his uh, representatives that going after it over and over and over again. So in Acts chapter 4, God says, look, I know you're full of the Spirit, Peter, but you've got this issue. You keep calling things unclean that I said are clean. So I want you to lay down your racism and go deal with people that I've called you to deal with. And that's the second lesson that we need to learn this morning is that if we're not careful, skin can become a three millimeter barrier that keeps you from your assignment. Because uh, God had, has an assignment for Peter. He's got this journey for Peter. He's saying to Peter, I don't want you just to deal with Jews. I want you to deal with Gentiles. I have an assignment on your life. I have a call on your life that what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to reach all men with the gospel. You're supposed to share the good news with everybody. You're supposed to love everybody. You're supposed to have a relationship with everybody. And so he, he, he confronts this fact that if you don't deal with the racism in your heart, then that skin issue can become a barrier that 
that will keep you from reaching the very people that I've called you to reach. And I just want to say that this morning that God confronts Peter and he says, look, your view of clean and unclean is restricting your ability to do what I've called you to do. You become so convinced that, 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 that this is acceptable, that living this way and believing this way is acceptable to the degree now you're, you're, going, you're willing to allow three millimeters of, of, of skin to keep you from re- fulfilling your destiny. And finally, Peter, he, he gives in. And, and we see in, in Acts chapter 10, I didn't read it to you, but in Acts chapter 10, he comes to a conclusion that uh, what, I, what he's been doing is wrong. Because in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, after he's preached and after they've been saved and after they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, this is what Peter says. Here's his conclusion. He says, then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. That's his conclusion. He says, I, I've come to this conclusion after watching God do what I didn't think he could do. I've concluded that God will accept anyone, and so should I. I have a question for you this morning. If nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, then why would we allow skin to separate us from those that Christ loves? Let me say it another way. If, if nothing shall separate us from the love of Christ, then why would we allow skin to separate us from the ones that Christ would want us to win? We cannot allow skin. Why would we allow skin to separate us? I want you to understand from this account, I've been reading this account over and over and over again, and what I've discovered from this account, but I've also learned it somewhere else. I, I happen to learn it by having kids. I, I've watched, watched my own kids, and I've watched other people's kids, and what I've discovered is that, that racism is learned. It is absolutely learned. But from this account, I've also discovered this. Racism can be unlearned. And that is the challenge that we have this morning is we have to unlearn what we've allowed to take root in our heart because we cannot allow skin to keep us from fulfilling the assignment and the destiny and the call on this congregation, which is to bring people to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ regardless of their skin color. That is our call. That is our assignment. The last thing I want to show you this morning is this, and this is, this is where I want to dig down a little bit. I want you to understand that skin can cause us to shift. Skin, if we allow it, can cause us to shift. You say, well, what are you talking about? I said in the beginning that I wanted to examine one of the more difficult challenges that we face as a nation, as a culture right now, uh, as believers right now, uh, as just general people right now. We face this challenge. And you're saying, well, you're talking about racism. That, that is a challenge, and we need to face it. But I'm not sure it's the main challenge that, that Scripture reflects here because I think the bigger challenge is this. I want, I want you to see if I can show you is, is that the, the greatest challenge here is that Peter uh, allowed himself to shift to be acceptable by his culture. Okay, so let me explain. I want you to notice that by the time we walk into Galatians, where I read to you out of Galatians, what we have is a man who is full of the Holy Spirit, who God has pinpointed racism in his heart three times, used him to win Gentiles to Christ. And then we roll into Galatians, and what we discover is that this same man who had a vision and was confronted and came to the conclusion that God will accept everybody, Peter has now allowed cultural pressure to cause him to shift back towards racism. That's literally what's taking place in, in, in Galatians chapter 2. Skin caused him to slide or to shift back into alignment with his culture. So now what happens in Galatians chapter 2 is Paul shows up. Now Paul wasn't a cat that you messed with Paul. Paul will just tell you how it was. And the Bible says that Paul walks into Galatians and he watches Peter who was eating dinner with non-Jewish people until people from uh, the religious leaders from Jerusalem showed up and all of a sudden now Peter won't have anything to do with the non-Jewish people. And Paul, being who he was, said, look here buddy, 
right in front of you and everybody, right in front of God and everybody. I'm going to confront you, and I'm going to challenge you, and I'm going to force you to deal with the racism in your own heart, and I'm going to tell you what you're doing is wrong. He confronts him. See, he recognized if we're not careful, then skin will cause us to shift, and it can cause us to get sidetracked on things that don't really matter and, and miss our destiny. So, so I just, I, I'm not Paul. I'm not saying I'm Paul, but I, I may just need to play the role of Paul a little bit this morning and, and, and stand up in front of you and say, look, I need to challenge some things. I need to confront you on some things. You might say, well, listen, uh, uh, we say the right things in here. And we pat ourselves on the back and go, well, we got it together. We're, we're neighbor lovers. We're not neighbor haters. And then we'll walk out of here, and if we're not careful, we will allow skin issues to cause us to shift right back into alignment with our culture. So things like this happen. Well, somebody will tell an off-color joke, and because you're not at church, you'll laugh. Don't look at me like that. I'm just playing Paul, and you get to be Peter today. All right? That's not right. That is not right. Uh, we can say that we aren't racist in here because we sit in a multicolored, uh, multi-hued congregation, and we can pat ourselves on the back. But we need. But at the same time, if we're not careful, we can leave here and harbor hate in our own hearts towards people of a different color, different race, different culture. But because we worship together on a Sunday, we pat ourselves on the back and say we're not racist. We're not racist. And I just want to tell you this morning that if we're not careful, we can allow our culture to begin to have more influence on us than kingdom culture. I want to tell you this morning that there is no room in kingdom culture for racism. So Paul would not let Peter get by with shifting. And so I want to uh, confront you very bluntly this morning, very practically this morning, and just say some things to you. It is not appropriate. It is not acceptable. For any one of us to perpetuate or to participate in racism in any form. I didn't think I'd get much help. Okay, so that includes white on black, black on white, white on brown, brown on white, black on brown, brown on black, man on woman. Woman on man. There is no room. There is no appropriate time. There is never any time in our existence as Christians where we have the right to perpetuate or to participate in racism. Okay, so let me get right down. That means you've got to be careful with what words you select. Well, all this, you know, all this police on the words. I don't like. I ought to be able to say any word I want to. Not if you belong to Christ. Okay. So we should never have to confront you with using the N word, and we should never have uh, have to confront you with somebody using uh, words to reflect back on white people. There, we should never. There is no white power, black power. There is only Jesus power. That means we got to be very, very careful about what we like on Facebook. Do you know when you push like on Facebook, it's just like you said it? Don't forward stuff. Don't like stuff. Don't post stuff. If you post it, if you like it, if you forward it, it's your position. At that moment, it becomes your position. Okay, so here's the questions we need to ask. We need to ask ourselves, um, are we accepting the unacceptable from our society? I don't know if you figured it out yet, but society is trying to separate us. For, for hundreds of years, the most segregated hour, and even to this day, is still the Sunday morning hour, but... Uh, 
finally, groups of people like us are trying to, to beat that barrier down and say, no, it's not. We want it to look like heaven when we gather. Every week we want it to look like heaven. On our stage we want it to look like heaven. In our leadership we want it to look like heaven. In our congregation we want it to look like heaven. In our children's ministry we want it to look like heaven. So we're beating that down. But, but society is trying to beat it back onto us and say, listen, you had it right. You should stay separate. There should be black churches, and there should be white churches, and there should be brown churches, and nobody should mix. And I'm saying to you that as a congregation, we've got to quit asking the questions whether it's acceptable in our culture. We must ask what is acceptable according to Jesus. And Jesus showed us over and over and over again that he was trying to break down racial barriers so that we would gather together. One of the questions we need to ask is, is, and do is we need to think like Jesus. We need to act like Jesus. We need to quit being so caught up in skin and get caught up in souls. Did you hear what I just said? That is a paradigm change for many of us. We have got to quit being so focused on skin color and start dealing with people on a soul level and say we are concerned about people's soul. Their skin does not matter. I'll, I'll close with this. Two, two statements. One is I, I've, I've talked to you in the past about church that I used to work at, and, and I told you what it was like. We would, it was a very uh, Caucasian uh, congregation. The only uh, people of color would show up on special days uh, for meals, and then we would bring African American folks in to cook for us. They couldn't eat with us. They couldn't worship with us. It was ridiculous. Uh, or when they, or when, uh, or when the church needed cleaning, uh, we would bring in people of color. And I stood up in that pulpit and asked them a question. I want to ask you this morning: What difference does it make if their skin is black if their soul is white? And what difference does it make if their skin is white and their soul is black? What should join us together is that, that on the soul level, we are brothers and sisters, and we need to get over our skin issues and become concerned once again about somebody's condition in their soul. Yeah. Finally, let me just say this to you. I, I, I begin to think, well, did Jesus really confront racism like I think he did? I think he, I, I think he did. I've, I've looked over and over again, and the fact that Jesus would leave on a regular basis... I, uh, some of us are having a meeting at church about Israel. We're getting ready to go to Israel. You're going to see it firsthand, but I'm just going to try to paint a picture for you. On, on one side of the Sea of Galilee, it was all Jews. On the other side of the Sea of Galilee, it was all Gentiles, the Decapolis, 10 cities, 10 Greek cities over on the hill. And, and, and the Jews stayed on their side, and the Gentiles stayed on their side except for Jesus. And I, and I started thinking back about an account out of the New Testament where the Bible says that Jesus, um, he's on the Jewish side. It's eight miles across the sea. It, it's, it's out of his way, but he gets in a boat, and he goes all the way across, eight miles, and he pulls up on the banks of the side of the Sea of Galilee where there were Gentiles. In fact, it was so Gentile-filled uh, that on the hill there was a, a temple, a, 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 a heathen temple where they sacrificed pigs. Think. They sacrificed pigs. Why do you think that when Jesus got on that side of the, the sea that he's met by a man in the cemetery who's demon-possessed and Jesus confronts the demons and casts them into pigs? Why were there so many pigs? Because they were using them in worship to Greek gods. And we get caught up in all that and we, oh, this is a cool story. He casts out demons, he throws them to the pigs, pigs fly, and they get all mad and run him out, all this kind of stuff. And we miss the whole lesson. The lesson is, is that Jesus got in a boat and went eight miles out of his way to talk to one guy who was not even from his own skin color or race to break down barriers. Because the Bible says that when Jesus cast out the demons, he got right back in the boat and went right back across the Sea of Galilee. And I think he was trying to teach us that we, if we're not careful, skin becomes a sea that separates us. And he's asking us to get in the boat and cross the sea and come to the side where people need help and respond. I want to applaud you this morning. You're one of the best congregations I've ever met. We, we, 
from day one, it was part of our, it's part of our DNA. From day one, we have put uh, multiracial, multiethnic people in every level of our uh, leadership so that you would learn the lesson just by watching. But I just got to keep driving at home. We want to we wanna do a, a, a God job on you like God, God did to Peter. We want to rip out every, every root of racism. Because if we're not careful, on the surface level, it can look like we're not racist and we worship together, but we leave and we continue to harbor hurt and anger and pain and separation in our hearts. And when we do that, it becomes a barrier that keeps us from fulfilling the destiny and the purpose and the plan that Jesus has for us. And so I just want to challenge you this morning. I need you to do this. I, need, I just want to challenge you. I want you to search your heart. Down deep inside. Maybe it's been passed down from generation to generation. Maybe it's a cultural thing that you've listened to the voices in culture and they grabbed your attention and you've begun to believe what they say is acceptable. I just need you to dig down deep, deep in your own spirit, in your own life, and your own heart and ask this question. Ask this question. I, this is not the question, so don't ask this question. Uh, let me give you the question I don't want you to ask. I don't want you to ask, am I a victim of racism? What I want you to ask is this, am I a racist? Because a lot of times if we're victims of racism, we become racist back the other way. So all I'm asking the Holy Spirit to do this morning is this, to shine the spotlight on our thought process, on our heart. We talked about this principalities, principles. The Spirit wars against the principalities, the principles that the culture has tried to shove down our throat. I'm asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to deal with the principles and the principalities in your own life and ask yourself this question. Am I a racist? Is there any racism in me at all? I'm going to ask if you were full of the Spirit. Is there any racism in you at all? And if there is, I'm asking you to allow the Holy Spirit to confront it. And Catherine, if you'll come to the keyboard, this is how we're going to end this morning. I want you to stand with me just briefly, just briefly, just briefly. You say, well, Steve, you, don't, you, you, you just don't get it. I, ha- haven't you seen how the people with that skin color act? Well, yeah. Haven't you seen how the people in, with the same skin color you have act? They're stupid people out of every color, shade, and hue. If you want to be racist, be a racist against stupidity, all right? Uh, Let's get over the skin thing. Let's get over the skin thing. One of my pet peeves, y'all just got to let me vent. I don't get to vent very often, so let me vent. I grew up in Anadarko, Oklahoma. Y'all don't know. If you didn't live in Anadarko, Oklahoma, you don't know. My high school was made up of about um, 60%, probably 60% Native American Indian, 30, maybe 30% Caucasian and 10% African American. You say, well, man, I wouldn't want to live in Anadarko. Have you ever driven through Anadarko? Who would want to live in Anadarko? I'm glad I lived in Anadarko. It forced me at a very young age to realize that not everybody's the same skin color, but we're all alike. And I would hear comments come out of my community like, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. Um, I would hear stuff like white trash. One of my pet peeves is racism. I can't stand it. I cannot stand it. And I'm just telling you that 
God has orchestrated Passion Church. I believe that. To be different. We have got to continue to be a place, not just in church, because see, when we talk about, I think here's the, here's the challenge. When we talk about church, when I talk about Passion Church, you think I'm only talking about Sunday morning. It has nothing to do with Sunday morning, because we got it right on Sunday morning. When we talk about Passion Church, I'm talking about Passion Church like on Monday, and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We have got to get it right all the time. So why? Because that's our assignment, number one. But because number two, we want people, at least I do, I want people to know my Jesus. And if I'm racist, surprise, they'll think Jesus is racist too. And he proved he wasn't. So if we're going to follow his example, we've got to get this thing right. I'm going to pray over you, and then while I'm praying, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to do what I can't do. And then I'm going to tell you what we're going to do out of this. So let's pray. Father, I have a very simple prayer this morning. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work in us like you worked on Peter, and that in this very moment, whether we have a vision or not, it would be like a vision in that we would recognize that what you said to Peter is true to us as well. What you've called clean, we cannot call unclean. So, Father, I pray that you turn the spotlight onto our souls right now. I ask you to turn the spotlight onto our souls right now. And, Father, under the sound of my voice, if there is anyone who deep down in their core, whether it was passed to them by their parents or whether they learned it, However it arrived, I, I just pray that in this moment, that deep down in our core, if there's any racism in us at all, I pray you would confront it in us for what it is. It's sin. And it's a trick of the enemy to separate us. So, Father, I pray for every white person in this room that you would Search our hearts, and if we harbor any ill will, if we har harbor any racism, any prejudice towards someone of a different race, I pray in the name of Jesus right now, you would root that out of us. I didn't choose to be white. You chose, and you made me. So, Father, I pray that you would confront racism in my race right now. I pray for every person of color under the sound of my voice this morning. I pray that if there's any shred, any sliver of racism in them, I pray this morning that you would expose that for what it is. It's sin. I pray that you would cause us together corporately to have a spirit of compassion and you would allow our focus to shift away from three millimeters of skin, and you would allow our, our entire focus to become souls. When everybody else in our culture is using language that is derogatory and racist, I pray that we would abstain. I pray that, Father, in, in the middle of a culture and a society where there's walls of divisions being built up, trying to separate us, I pray that we would fight against it with everything. We would speak up. We would be the voice that say, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's wrong. We're family. That's wrong. I pray that you would challenge us this morning. As they continue to play, I want your heads bowed for just a moment, and I just want the Holy Spirit to talk to you individually before I release you to do what we're going to do. Father, I pray in this quiet moment right here, you would do what I cannot do. Turn spotlights on in our hearts and in our spirits. I ask you to do this.
Father, as you've exposed in our own hearts, corporately we come together this morning and we repent. We ask you to forgive us. Forgive us of acting in ways that you would not want us to act. Saying things you wouldn't want us to say. Posting things that you would not want us to post. Liking things we should not like. I pray that you would help us to do better. Help us to do better. Help us to be better. As we learn to love one another based on the redeeming blood of Jesus. May we become bridges to you rather than barriers to you. May we, may we tear down every wall of separation and show our society what it's really supposed to be like. I ask you to do this in Jesus' name. Now, this is how we're going to end. Next week, we're going to talk about common ground. And I'm going to show you very vividly what people have to deal with. Because we cannot say that people inside these four walls don't deal with racism. We do. We have. We'll show you that next week. So this week, this is what I wanted to do. So what, it wasn't me, it was my family. So you're the representative. It was, it was my grandparents. You're, you're the representative. They're not here. Well, I didn't do it. They did it. I understand. But we have people inside these four walls that have dealt with racism all their life. And all they needed is somebody that doesn't look like them to look at them and say, look, man, I'm so sorry. Sorry somebody treated you like that. That's wrong. I accept you as my brother or my sister in Christ. That's why we're together is we're in Christ. So I'm gonna add, I'm gonna make you very uncomfortable and I get it. But some of us have to be Paul. We have to stand in the gap for everybody. And so this morning what I want you to do is you're led by the Holy Spirit just for a few moments before Danny comes to close us out, just for a few moments. I want you to find somebody that's not like you. They're not like you. The three millimeter that rests up here that you can see that they didn't choose and you didn't choose is not like you. You're standing in for an entire race. Well, that's a big that's a big response. I get it. I don't feel like I yeah, you can. I want you to find somebody that doesn't look like you, and I want you to go to them. And I just, I just want you to say, look, I'm sorry. It's family. For me and my house, we won't, like, we won't act like this. We won't accept this. We refuse to allow a shift to take place. We'll deal with each other as family. Would you do that? Would you allow the Holy Spirit to use you to possibly heal the wounds and the hurts of people that have been dealing with racism all their life and who feel like outcasts and feel like nobody loves them? Would you do that? You don't even know what's getting ready to happen in the middle of this moment. The Holy Spirit can do some powerful, powerful things.
I'm reminded of a song when I was a child that we used to sing. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. And you know what? Children grow up, and his love doesn't change. Amen, amen. As you're preparing your morning tithes and offerings, if you're a first-time visitor, you receive the bulletin when you walk in, and in the bulletin you'll find a communication card. If you will find that out, uh, fill that out and find Mr. Rogers back in the back of the sanctuary, alias Pastor Steve. He has a uh, gift he would like to give you, so make sure you see him. If you're a second-time visitor, guess what? You're part of the family. Amen? It don't matter what your color of your skin is. It doesn't matter if you still hate. You're still part of the family because we believe God's going to take the hate out of you before you get out of this place. Again, if you'll see Mr. Rogers back in the back, he's got a special gift for you, so make sure you do that. As the ushers are coming to morning tithes and offerings, a couple of announcements for you. If you signed up last week for Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames, we have a schedule for you. So if you'll go to the green room after service and pick up your schedule, that'll give you the times you need to be here for all of that. So make sure you do that if you're a part of that. And then immediately following service, there'll be a safety meeting. If you're interested in being on the safety team, if you will join the team out on the porch, out in front of the church here, there will be a short meeting. See uh, Darren out there, and he will meet you and get you initiated into the safety team. So uh, make sure that happens. Amen. And at this time, we have a video we would like to show you. No flashy prayers. No religious requirement. No perfect people. Nope, you won't find that here. See, the message of Jesus was never meant to be complicated. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Not complex, not confusing, just simple. Simple faith, simple life, simple hope. I'm loving these sermon series. I don't know about you all, but I think they're fantastic. If you will stand with me this morning, let's go out with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this word. Father, I pray that you'll place people in our path this week that we can talk to, that we can lead to Jesus Christ and keep it simple and uncomplicated. We thank you for that. And we praise you. And in your name, we ask that. We show love to everyone we meet this week. And all of God's people said, amen. You are dismissed.